to steal your faith, because if he can steal your faith, then he can steal your eternal destination. This thing is, it, it, what, what, it, it really is a mind, mind game. It really is a war of the mind. Stephanie, how are you? Hey, Shabri. Long time no see. I hope to see you soon. Donna, welcome. Good afternoon to you. everyone is having as always a great great day as you're moving into your weekend and enjoying uh, looking forward to a hopefully a beautiful weekend uh, sunshine hey Leah Sheree hello good afternoon all right I'm going to get right into this. Let me turn this down. We are talking about our life, our lives in Christ. And um, yesterday we we uh, were, ta well, we were talking about just spiritual maturity, but yesterday we kind of shifted into talking about spiritual immaturity, being immature Christians. And so in order to kind of get a... Um, an idea as to the uh, how we got started with that yesterday. If you weren't here uh, yesterday, please go back and uh, take a look at that. But we are in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm reading verses 1 through 3. Uh, again, we're talking about being immature Christians and uh, really just exposing what Christian immaturity looks like in our lives so that we can identify it if we see it or if it's if it's in our lives. And of course, we want to continue to grow and not remain in that lifestyle of being what we learned yesterday was a fleshly Christian, which is the same as uh, an immature Christian. A spiritual Christian would be considered a mature Christian and a fleshly Christian is considered an immature Christian. So now, not only are we able to look at the fruit of our lives, but we're also able to judge the fruit of the lives of other people and um, and to know where they are, to know, to, to be able to, to discern where they are based upon the word of God. So uh, let's get right into this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Verses one through three, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men. Paul said, I really would like to speak to you as spiritual men and women, but I can't. I can't, but I have to speak to you. It goes on and says, but as to men of flesh, he said, I can't speak to you as spiritual men or spiritual people but I got to speak to you as people of flesh. And then he goes on and says this as to infants in Christ. So again, the word of God is telling us that those, uh, those born again, Christians that are living fleshly, they are number one, immature. And number two, they're babies. Okay. They are immature and that they are babies that those that are living fleshly. Um, Chapter, excuse me, verse two, he said, I gave you milk to drink. That's what babies, that's what babies feed off of. We all know that babies feed off of milk, not solid food because babies 
can't handle solid food yet. He said, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food. Obviously, he's not talking about actual milk and actual food. He's talking about the level of teaching that he was able to present to them, uh, you know, the, the milk being the very foundational things and then the meat being more, more revelation of the word of God. He said, I couldn't give you the meat. I couldn't give you the solid food for you were not able to receive it then. And indeed, even now you're not able. He said, listen, this is interesting. He said that some time has lapsed that, you know, there was one point where, yes, you should have been on milk and I should have given you milk and not meat. You weren't ready for it. He said, so you weren't ready for it then. That's cool. That's fine. But he said, but here is the, here is the, um, the issue. They're still not ready for it. Over time, something should have happened. Over time, as a born again believer, as a follower of Jesus Christ, there should be some sign of maturity. And what he was saying was, you're still acting fleshly. You're still behaving fleshly. Here it is. You're still living fleshly. When time has elapsed in your time, uh, in your walk with the Lord, where you should have been progressing towards maturity, you're not. That's an issue. It shouldn't be. If you're, if, if you've been, been born again for years, you still should not be living in an immature, fleshly lifestyle. It shouldn't be happening. So he says, um, verse three, for you are still fleshly. You're still fleshly. For since there is, and now he's, now he's describing the aspect of them living fleshly, uh, the more sp uh, particulars, I should say, of them living fleshly. He said, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, jealousy, strife, two works of the flesh, two works of the flesh. And that's what we're going to go to in just a minute, the works of the flesh. He said, it's still there. You're, you're dealing with jealousy still. You should be a mature man of God, a mature woman of God. You're still dealing with jealousy. You're, you should be a, a mature, mature man of God, a mature woman of God. You're still dealing with strife. You shouldn't be. He said, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking, walking, that word, word walking. Whenever you see walking in the Bible, it means this, living. To walk, when he says walking, it means that you're still living a certain way. You still have a certain lifestyle, a certain lifestyle. So let me read verse three again before we go to Galatians five. For you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? See, listen to this. He said, you're still walking like everybody else, mere men. Now, now that's interesting because he says mere men as if to say there is another level of living that, that they should be living in. Not like mere men, but watch this, like supernatural men and women, like spiritual men and women. In other words, he's saying you shouldn't be living like everybody else. You should not be living like everybody else that are not followers of Jesus Christ. You should be living spiritually. You should be living in a mature way. You should be living in a supernatural way, right? So we're seeing something here. We're seeing a correlation between fleshly and immaturity. We're seeing a correlation between spiritual and maturity. Now let's go back to Galatians 5. And we see in Galatians 5, this list of the works of the flesh this list of the works of the flesh. And yesterday we, we began talking about, let me get my scripture here. Yesterday we began talking about the first two of the works of the flesh out of Galatians chapter five. I believe it starts in verse 19. Yeah, 19, 20, and 21. The first two that we talked about yesterday was adultery, that's a work of the flesh, and fornication. Voice just went out. Adultery, 
and fornication, two works of the flesh. If we're living in a lifestyle of adultery or living in, a, in an ongoing habitual behavior of adultery or fornication, then we're living fleshly. We're living fleshly. In other words, we're immature, all right? Um, and we talked a little bit about yesterday uh, uh, what sin is. Sin simply means to miss the mark, to miss the mark. Throughout the remainder of our lives, let me just share this because the Bible does not, the, does not teach sinless perfection in this life. It does not teach sinless perfection in this life. So myself or nobody else on here that's watching or that will ever watch this will ever live from this moment on for the rest of their lives in sinless perfection. None of us will. Okay, so I just want to get that on put that on the table right now so you know it's not going to happen. All right, but but what should happen is that if we sin, it is a sin. It is not a lifestyle of sin. Okay, if we sin, then what are we to do? We are to confess that sin and repent of it. Again, okay, again, for somebody who may be new, what is repentance? A re the repenting of something means to change my mindset towards it. So if I commit that sin, to truly repent of it means that, okay, I was willing to do it that time, but I'm not willing to do it ever again. That is true repentance. I did it, but I'm not willing to do it ever again. That is true repentance. Now, here is what I remember, you know, back uh, when I first got saved. <laughs> I, I I did not, I, I did not, uh, it wasn't true repentance for me. It was confession. Remember, it's supposed to be confession and repentance. Mine was confession, then do it again, then confession then do it again, then confession, then do it again, then confession. How much time we got? Then do it again, then confession. Let me keep going. Then do it again, then confession. That's not true repentance. That's not true repentance. That was spiritual immaturity. That was living fleshly as a born again believer. So if you find yourself in a, in a, in a uh, lifestyle of, okay, Father, I'm confessing it to you, but then I'm doing it again. Then I'm confessing I'm doing it again. That's not true repentance. And what it's showing is fleshly living or spiritual immaturity, listen, in that area of life. Spiritual immaturity in that area of life. So today, let's talk about a couple of more, three more out of the, how many, I don't know how many it is. I'm not going to even count right now. Let's talk about the next three uh, works of the flesh to make sure we are able to expose and identify if we are living a lifestyle of uh, living in the, in the flesh, all right? Um, Galatians 5.19, Galatians 5.19. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here are the works of the flesh. Yesterday, we talked about adultery. Yesterday, we talked about fornication, right? And then today, we're going to talk about the next three. Uncleanness, that's a work of the flesh. Lasciviousness, that's a big word. That's a work of the flesh. We go break it down. And then idolatry, that's a work of the flesh. So adultery, fornication yesterday, today, uncleanness, lasciviousness, and idolatry. What is uncleanness? Uncleanness means... Uh, whatever is opposite of purity, including, listen to this, sodomy, homosexuality, lesbianism. Whatever is opposite of purity, including sodomy, homosexuality, lesbianism. Now, um, Uncleanness, when we say opposite of purity, what is purity? Well, purity means to keep ourselves for the will of God, to keep ourselves for the will of God. Now, it points out sexual, uh, excuse me, it points out uh, sodomy, homosexuality, lesbianism. Why? Because the first two covered everything else. 
adultery, fornication, which really covers everything, but adultery and fornication. So now we're just talking about uncleanness. To live in a lifestyle of uncleanness, all right, which includes what I just listed, that is a work of the flesh. Now, check it out. Listen, listen. It does not mean, it does not mean that they're not saved, just like the adulterer. If somebody's an adulterer, in an, uh, you know, an ongoing lifestyle of adultery, it does not mean at that point that they are not a born again believer. When they're in fornication as a lifestyle, it does not mean that they're at that point. Listen, I'm listen to what I'm saying. At that point, a born again believer. Um, uncleanness. Someone, someone's dealing with lesbianism or homosexuality. It does not mean that they're not born again. Okay. What does it mean, though? It means that they are uh, delving, that they're in a lifestyle of the works of the flesh, meaning that they're immature in their walk with God. So, you know, why do I, why do I, why do I, uh, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on this because for some reason, for some reason, um, I don't know if it's society or what it is, but for some reason, everybody can, ex not excuse, excuse definitely is not the right word. Everyone can have uh, compassion upon an adulterer or a fornicator, but when it comes to someone who's homosexual or lesbianism, it's like you cannot even be saved if you're doing that. Well, no, that's a work of the flesh. That's why we love, this, this goes into something else. I'm not going to even get into that because it's 1218. But we love everybody right where they are because it's the Holy Spirit who cleans us up. See, that's why we're going through these works of the flesh, because your thing might not be my thing, and my thing might not be your thing, but if it's a thing, we need the Holy Spirit to deal with it in our individual lives. So to go at somebody else like you are just, oh, how could you? And yet we are under one of these works of the flesh. We're no different. We're no different. So let's stop looking at people like they are so different and let's love them and, and teach them. Love them and teach them so that then they can be delivered and, and, and healed or whatever. They, or they can repent, whatever they need to do in order to, in order to continue to walk with God. Now, so let me move to the next one, then I'm going to finish up with, uh, with, with, with something else though. Uncleanness. So we went over uncleanness. We went over uncleanness. Lasciviousness. What is lasciviousness? Promoting or partaking of that which tends to produce lewd emotions. Anything tendering to foster sex, sin, and lust. Lasciviousness. Promoting or partaking of that which tends to produce lewd emotions. Lewd emotions, uh, un, uh, uh, un, impure emotions. Now, see, this is where some people, uh, some, some denom well, anyway, this is where aspects of the, the body of Christ that we get into legalism with this. This is where people say, hey, don't go to movies at all. Don't go to movies at all. Why? Because that is of the world. And if you go to the movie, then here's what it's going to do within you. Well, you know what? Partially, I agree. In other words, what lasciviousness is saying is not to promote or partake in anything which is going to produce within us lewd, unpure, impure emotions that's going to cause us to run out and do things we should not be doing. That's what lasciviousness is. So, example, and this, this is a general example, you know, Music is powerful. Music is powerful. Um, now, me and my wife, we listen to you know, good, listen to you know, some some uh, R and B music, uh, romantic music, and you know, and we love each other. Blah blah blah. Okay, all right, we do that. All right, cool. But if we weren't saved, excuse me. 
if we weren't married and we put ourselves in a situation where, hey, having a romantic evening, we got, you know, we have something to eat, we got the music on, and it's getting us into this place where we want to come together and, and have sex, that is, that is where we are living dangerously. That's what lasciviousness is talking about. Because as a, uh, um, I hate saying single because even if you're born, if you're single, well, anyway, as an unmarried, as an unmarried man and an unmarried woman spending time together, we're supposed to spend the time together. That's what you do when you're dating. You're supposed to have fun together, but we should have boundaries, boundaries. We want to make sure that we are, are if, we're, if we're using wisdom, let's just put it that way. If we're using wisdom, we want to make sure we set boundaries that we're not watching or listening to anything that's going to get that flesh going. And then here we go. <laughs> we done done something that now we know that we don't want it. We shouldn't have done. And then what do we do, though? If we do it, we confess it and repent of it. Not confess it and do it again and confess it and do it again and confess it and do it again and confess it and do it again. But confess it and repent of it. So that's what lascivious means. It, it means something that um, that produces lewd emotions. It produces lewd emotions. And those, those emotions, by the way, are only lewd because of our current status in that relationship. They become fine once I'm married. But if I'm not married, then... It's lewd because it's causing me to do something outside of the boundaries of how God has set it up. So once we say I do, now we're watching some or we're listening to some, you know, some music, some Luther. I'm dating myself. Whatever, whatever. Y'all know what I'm saying. You know, um, listening to something and our emotions get going. And we, and yo, so anyway, y'all know we adults. All right. Um, last one is idolatry. <laughs> y'all laughing at me too. I'm trying <laughs> I'm trying to say it without saying it. <laughs> um, uh, idolatry. Idolatry. Uh, what is idolatry? Last thing. Anything on which affections are passionately set. <laughs> Erica, don't laugh at me. Um, idolatry. Anything on which affections are passionately set. Idolatry. Well, that that's that's kind of that's a brief definition of what idolatry is, and I'm I'm finishing up. I went a little long. I'm sorry, y'all. Um, uh, but idolatry basically means this: when we uh, when those passions for something or someone causes us to put it before our relationship with God. When those passions uh, and affections for something or someone, right, uh, uh, causes us to put it before God. Well, the question becomes, how do I know if they're before God? Well, the answer is, are you compromising your, your, yourself for it or them? Are you compromising yourself for it or them? In other words, are you crossing the line? If, if, if that thing, you know, if that thing makes you, draws you away from God and you have put all of your time and energy and passion into it and now you're ignoring God, then it's become an idol. Then it's become an idol. That's how you know. Well, I, I don't have time to pray anymore because I'm working this business. It's become an idol. I don't have time to spend with God anymore, to worship God, or to do this because I'm always spending time with them, whoever him or her is, well, then they become an idol in your life. Anything that pulls you away from God, including ourselves, that pulls us away from God has become an idol, all right? So three areas we talked about, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. I need 60 seconds because I want to hit this. No, I don't. I'm going to do it later. I'm going to do it later. I'm going to do it later. It's time. All right. We're finished for the day. Happy Friday to you. Um, and, uh, oh, that's good too, uh, Mary Henderson. 
focusing on your problems. That absolute, that's a good one. And see that, yeah, that's excellent because because we put our problems bigger than God. See, uh, Mary, um, you're trying to make me stay longer, but I gotta go. All right, y'all. <laughs> Y'all have a great, great Friday. Tonight, I'm so excited. Looking forward to our Married for Life event. Um, have a great weekend. Hope to see you on Sunday. We'll be here at 11 a.m. on Sunday. Thank you all for another great week and coming together in the Word of God. Enjoy your day. Love you. Bye-bye.